Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Trail Talk. I'm so glad you could join us today. Doing this one trail talk a week feels like it's forever between, <laughs> but we're just doing that through the rest of July. Come August, we'll be back to two a week. Um, but for today's um, topic, we have a guest. You can see this is uh, Mark McGeehy. And Mark is, a, you live in Lawton? I am is in Lawton. Right? Okay, right. he lives in Lawton. He's um, a historical interpreter. He's a specialist on Native American historical sites, um, military historic history. Um, Teaching well, at the University of uh, Cameron. In Cameron. Teach, right. uh, are you currently yes. a professor yes. there? Yes. Okay, very good. Professor at Cameron University. Early U.S. history. Ah, I bet that's a great class. I love it because I mean he's so knowledgeable. But um, he is here today to talk to us. Uh, I, I love the topic. He he's going to talk to us about the Chisholm Trail, the Native American connection, which is so timely because just this year we uh like a, we kind of have a theme that we go with every year and diversity on the Chisholm Trail. Right is our theme and so we've been introducing this to the school children all summer with that's that's our main topic is teaching about that and just to let you the viewers know one of every three cowboys on the Chisholm Trail was either a black cowboy Native American cowboy or a vaquero or Mexican right. cowboy right. so there was a lot more diversity on those trail rides than we are accustomed to seeing it when we watch a movie or TV show about the, the portrayal is um, most, most of the cowboys are white cowboys. And so it's really nice to me for us to, to dig into this a little deeper and introduce the fact that there was a really a, a much more diverse group of men who, this is the best part to me, respected each other and trusted each other and even though they there was a, a pay difference, mm -hmm. um, there was a little bit of a financial uh, consideration that went along with the racial, uh, di the different races. But all in all, when they were working together, they were one. They were a team. They were. They were. And that is what is very important. And I think it's important for us to teach uh, people about that. I agree. So I'm very uh, excited to talk to you today. But before I do, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. You, We were talking before we went live and you were born in California, but your family moved That's back right. to yeah. Oklahoma and That's you right. grew up here. Absolutely. Uh, I am a uh, Okie. Uh, that uh, has been here as well. Uh, we were only in California long enough, I guess, for me to be delivered at Hayward. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And uh, my brother uh, and I were both born in Hayward, uh, California, back in the early 50s. And uh, so dad uh, did not find permanent work. Uh, he was a working man and, mm -hmm. and wound up at the Lacey Company uh, for, oh, uh, he had a, a career of 45 years, oh my. and uh, 30 of those years was either driving a mixer truck uh, or on the order desk, about 10 years on the order desk, wow. and then the last 15 years of his work as a salesman, which was his life ambition, and my dad was a great salesman. My dad said that if you ever want to sell something and it won't sell, says don't lower the price, raise it. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. I'm going to remember that one. Right. <laughs> so um, what kind of drove your interest to history? Oh, even as a young boy, I was fascinated with history. And uh, I, like many young boys, and, and, and I'm tribal, uh, you know, uh, we played cowboys and Indians, and I was always an Indian. Uh, I didn't uh, win very often, but <laughs> but, but it was fun being an Indian because right. we got to wear uh, the war paint. We got to put on some feathers, even if they were turkey feathers, right. and, even if they were chicken feathers. <laughs> it was fun to dress up and uh, to be tribal. And of course, I attended the powwows of the tribe. Uh, I remember the Sack and Fox okay. Nation of Oklahoma. Right. And uh, we're remembered for uh, being uh, those that produced uh, Jim Thorpe, mm -hmm. the world's uh, one of the most greatest athletes. Greatest athletes. I mean, who, who has done as many things as Jim? Nobody. Nobody. Right? Nobody. And so uh, our war was the Black Hawk War. Abraham Lincoln was a captain of uh, militia, uh, Illinois militia. 
Uh -huh. But uh, Abraham Lincoln said the only blood that was shed in my outfit was to fist fights and mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So, so were the Sack and Fox originally from Illinois? Uh, they actually came out of uh, the Great Lakes area. Okay. And so some of them uh, migrated through Canada and uh, some of them uh, through the Great Lakes. Uh, into what was uh, what is now called Saginaw, uh, uh -huh. Michigan, was named for the Sauk, and uh, and then Sauconuc, uh, which is today's Rock Island, Illinois, uh, became one of the largest concentrations, if you could call it a village or a town, of Native Americans uh, in the early years of our country, yeah. and, and so in eighteen in the eighteen thirties we had a war chief named Black Hawk. And uh, I'm of the uh, the Black Hawk descendants band, and not, mm -hmm. not directly from Black Hawk, mm -hmm. but uh, but we were the British band during uh, the French and Indian War. We were on the winning side because we ran out the French who had, mis had been mistreating the Fox or the Meskwakis. Uh, then uh, the Revolution came along, and we got on the wrong side because uh, we still supported the, the, the great great father in England. Right. And the War of 1812, the same way. But uh, but the, the band eventually sort of separated into two groups, those that followed Keokuk, who made came to terms with the Pale Faces, uh, and then those that supported Black Hawk and were old traditional uh, tribal members more than uh, those that went along with the time. So how did the Sack and Fox come to Indian territory? Was that, was that a, a forced removal? After, after they were forcibly removed west of the Mississippi during the Black Hawk War, 1832, okay. then, uh, then there were like uh, one band, those uh, Keokuk's people wound up in Kansas. So did my ancestors for a while. Many of the Fox or the Meskwakis uh, gathered together some money and surprised everybody by buying land. You never heard of Indians buying land, hmm. but they moved back to Iowa, which was their old stomping grounds, and became a community to this day okay. of descendants of the Meskwaki tribe. Uh, later, some of their boys uh, were code talkers too, as late as World War II. But my people came into Oklahoma after the Civil War. And so after the Civil War, they brought oh. the British band mm -hmm. descendants into Oklahoma, mm -hmm. become the Sack and Fox Nation of Oklahoma. And those that followed Keoka were mostly kept up in northeastern Kansas, where they still are today. Right. And the second land run included Sack and Fox land. That's right. Uh, uh, our reservation has gone slow, uh, smaller and smaller and smaller, but it's still there right. at Stroud, Oklahoma. In Stroud, very interesting. I, I, um, I have uh, never really had a conversation. The Sack and Fox is a small. It is a small tribe, tribe compared to a lot the of others that you're right. And so I've never been able to have a conversation with anyone who knew all of that history. That's very interesting to me. And uh, in some of the stories, if we uh, maybe another time we can uh, get together, and I can tell you stories about uh, the, uh, the, the, the traditions and the history and the personalities of different people. Uh, we have uh, movie stars that uh, have uh, relatively recently passed away that, that some people might recognize. Very interesting. I would love that. You heard it right here, folks. Mr. McGee will be back and we'll have another <laughs> talk. But let's go ahead and get started on today's topic, okay. uh, the Chisholm Trail, the Native American Connection. That's right. Uh, from the earliest days of the Chisholm Trail, uh, you, you have to remember that the the wild west was still pretty wild right and uh, that tr that was true about uh, what was going on in west texas that was true about what was going on in indian territory uh the army and the cowboys were pretty much the vanguard of what we call western civilization mm -hmm. or at least the anglo uh civilization and uh, as the army came into Western uh, Indian territory, what is now Oklahoma, where we are, right. uh, Fort Sill was established and some other army posts were established because this, this, was the, this was the most dangerous place on the Southern Plains. Mm -hmm. And it was necessary to try to pacify, bring some peace to not only uh, the tribes so that the Western settlers and, and uh, merchants could come into the area, as well as uh, ministers of the gospel, but also between the tribes themselves, right. because there were tribes that were warring against each other. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, and some of those feelings have continued uh, to recent times. Right. The the Chisholm Trail connection became important because after the Civil War, there were tons of of cattle, mm -hmm. tons of steers that were just waiting to be uh, purchased and, and marketed. Uh, and uh, there were some efforts uh, before the Civil War and immediately following the Civil War to get these cattle up to Missouri. But the Missourians said, hey, there's a problem. You guys got ticks uh, mm -hmm. on your, uh, your uh, steers and we can't have those in Missouri. Well, uh, the, the demand- Because they carry the disease, right? That's right, that that's would, right, that that's right. That would be transmitted to the diverse. Missouri uh, cattle. Uh -huh. uh, but, the, but the Northern uh, markets for meat uh, were uh, clamoring for uh, Texas uh, beef. And so, uh, and so a, a route was developed uh, where Jesse Chisholm, who was half Cherokee, half Native American mm -hmm. himself, mm -hmm. uh, who was a friend of Black Beaver, of the Lenape, now uh, also remembered some people called him Delaware. Uh, he was, uh, Black Beaver was the one who actually uh, sort of made the trail what it was that Jesse Chisholm inherited. Okay. And, and so Chisholm uh, put his name, uh, nobody really remembers it, it's the Black Beaver Trail, but it, originally it was, and became the Chisholm Trail. And, and, and just to clarify, Jesse Chisholm was a merchant, a trader. That's right. That's right. And, and so his, his use of the trail was for trading or Absolutely. delivering goods to beef, his customers. Beef to the market. Beef right. to the market. That's he, right. he wasn't really involved as much in cattle drives. No, no, but he was he was the uh, he was the guy that, uh, that 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 kind of said, "Look, here is an opportunity. Here is a more direct way to mm -hmm. get to the market. Here is a, a better way where you can uh, take advantage of the water. A better way to a uh, better route to take care of the the grazing, the pastures, the pasture land. And incidentally, uh, I can help you uh, get uh, peaceful relations with the tribes that mm -hmm. you're going to pass through." So this was all a plus. These were all good items right. that, that could be brought about. And one of the remarkable things that, that, that I like about the Chisholm Trail is one of the things I like about Fort Sill. You can study the, the history of the West, but as you study the history of the West, the Cowboys and Indians are against, are against each other. You study the history of the West, the Army and the Indians are, are against each other. There's a lot of fights. But interestingly enough, out of that early uh, uh, fractious, uh, contentious, uh, you know, where people are confronting each other here in Western Indian Territory after the Buffalo War, mm -hmm. what's now known as the Red River War, right. the, the army uh, takes away many of the horses and, and all of the weapons they can mm -hmm. of the tribes that participated, which are most of the tribes in the area. And they say, you guys are, are no longer going to be looking for buffalo. They're all gone anyway. Mm -hmm. And these were the Plains tribes, not the five civilized right. tribes that were. Right. These that, are the Plains the tribes. Five tribes were all settled in in south in, 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 in and eastern east. and southeastern Oklahoma. And so now the army says, we're going to uh, help you find some, some uh, beef uh, substitute for the buffalo. And they say that there were teamsters that were bringing in some of the some of the uh, animals, uh, the the oxen and some of the steers and so forth. And they they said, "Whoa, ha!" And and the Indians heard that, and and so uh, people like Juana Parker and others would say, "Say uh, uh, if you wanted some some good food, get some woha." What was the Indian term for beef? Oh, and, uh, it, that's funny. It wasn't. It wasn't quite uh, buffalo, but it was the next best thing. Right. Well, so it's interesting um, in learning about diverse that you know the diversity on the trail. It came to my attention that really the cowboys, the cat, the cattle drivers, the drovers, they did not have a lot of fear or a lot of fighting battles with the Native Americans. Because they had already, they were beaten down by this point. They they no longer had firearms by and large. Right. But they still had their bows and arrows. They still had their tomahawks. They still had their scalping knives. Mm -hmm. But you didn't have to worry about a, a party of braves so much as long as they weren't wearing paint. Right. Now, if they got their right. war paint on, uh, you better be careful with yeah. them. And I'm sure that uh, there's a story that uh, toward the end of the trail, and uh, about this time of the year, maybe in the summer, 
of 1884, just as the trail was, ru was running down. Mm -hmm. A most remarkable story that is told by Bill Neely, who's one of our local historians. Okay. And I found this recently and I was amazed and surprised I had to share it. And that is that during this trail drive, but after 1878, the cowboys on the Chisholm Trail and the and the, the trail bosses, they're saying we don't have to hurry so much, especially as we're coming into this first part of Oklahoma. As as the, the, the animals came out of Texas and into uh, western Oklahoma and southwestern Oklahoma, right. they found the grass was greener. They found the water was more plentiful. Mm -hmm. And the trail bosses and the cowboys says, you know, let's slow down the animals. Let's let them graze. Mm -hmm. Let's fatten them up. Because uh, by the time we get them to Kansas, they're just going to be bones and that's right. not going to sell. Right. And so they would bring them into Oklahoma. Well, on this occasion, in the summer of 1884, uh, you have uh, a group of uh, 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 trail uh, drovers are bringing their, their cattle through. They, they cross through the Canadian River and they discover quicksand. Now, usually the, the cowboys, they would send some riders into the river to, to see if there was quicksand. They missed it. Uh, and so as they were coming into the river, there was like three or four of the cowboys that were driving the steers uh, found themselves in dire straits. And at that very moment, there was a chief, wasn't Quanta Parker, but it was a Comanche. Mm -hmm. And the, the chief brought his braves forward on horseback and they helped rescue the uh -huh. cowboys. When else do you hear a, a story about Indians, wild Indians rescuing cowboys? That is a great story. And so what they, these were magnificent. The Comanches were the greatest, right. the greatest oh. riders of the West. Yes. And so they would come in and they would pull the, 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 the cowboys and get them to safety. And then they go for their horses and bring their horses back to shore. Uh -huh. And then after they, they, they salvaged what could have been a serious calamity, then they put on a, a horsemanship display that the cowboys all enjoyed. Wow. What a fun story that is. And of course, as the cowboys brought their, their animals up the trail, uh, coming right through Duncan, right. Uh, they they found that mm -hmm. first they had to deal with the Comanches. Mm -hmm. And the Comanches, I mean, half of, of Oklahoma, Western Oklahoma, almost in its entirety, once was, was ruled by the Comanches. Right. Okay. And so they first they had to deal with the Comanches. Well, what are we going to do? Uh, are they going to shoot us? Well, probably not, but they could stampede the herd. And if they, if they stampede the herd during the night, or, or, or any time that we're passing through, we're gonna lose three or four, maybe a half a dozen animals. It's better just to go ahead and make a deal with them. Mm -hmm. so, so they would use the sign language and a lot of the trail bosses and the cowboys learn sign language. We have a great scene in our movie here where there's that yes, interaction between it. the Braves, they, they do well. the Braves they do and the very trail well. bosses. They do very well. And uh, in talking about that with some students, you know, I. It, it occurred to me that they weren't really as interested in causing trouble than the Native Americans as they were in feeding their families. That's right. That's they correct. They were starving. In many cases, they their, their supplies, their annuities uh, did not arrive on time. And in a number of cases, because of government corruption, mm -hmm. what they did get was substandard. Spoiled. And that's right. Or, yeah. or, or poor quality to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. And so there were people who were making a lot of money off of uh, Indian services, providing them with provisions that were just cheats. Yes. They were crooks. Yes. And at the same time, during the same period from uh, 1865, 67, when the trail got underway until the end of the period, as, as late as 1889, there were so many outlaws. There were so many gunslingers that were taking what the Indians still had uh, as, the, as their own. Mm -hmm. And so the, the Native Americans, they had a, a challenge of dealing with, with the friendly cowboys. They had a challenge of dealing with the outlaw cowboys. And then they had a challenge of the soldiers. Yes. Because yes. it was at the end of the, of the Buffalo War in 1875 when our local army commander, Randall McKenzie, mm -hmm. who the Indians yes. called Bad Hand because yeah. he got his hand shot up during the Civil War, uh, Bad Hand was the one who introduced Quanta Parker, uh, among others, to Charles Goodnight. 
And Charles Goodnight taught Quanta Parker all that he needed to know, along with uh, the Burnett, Bert Burnett, and John, mm -hmm. taught Quanta everything they knew about starting into the cattle business. So what you find is, is uh, just as in Fort Sill, the Indians become uh, supportive of Fort Sill because the only way to continue the warrior tradition is to join the army. Mm. And uh, in the 1890s, you have Troop Bell, 7th Cavalry, that is made up entirely of Native Americans with, uh, with Anglo officers that are scouts. And Geronimo himself became one of the army scouts. Of, uh, of the uh, late 1890s. That right? That's right. Wow. Okay. So the cowboys who before this time, before the Civil War, those guys are the enemy. Uh, before the Civil War, uh, those guys are, are trespassing upon uh, Indian uh, land and, uh, and you, you just put an arrow in it. Well, uh, things change. And by the time the Chisholm Trail gets underway through Jesse Chisholm and some others, they say, look, you can make a deal. Mm -hmm. You made a deal with the army. Now make a deal with the cowboys, mm -hmm. and by and within a uh, very few years, in 1883, 18, uh, Quantum Parker still in a teepee, mm -hmm. but at the end of the Chisholm Trail period, the Texas Rangers they say, Quanta, you're too important a guy to be living in a teepee. Let's build your house. Right. And so the Star House is built yes. by Texas uh -huh. uh, ranchers, mm -hmm. and and the funny thing is, you know, there's Texans that are that are uh, trying to look at the grazing lands. And even talking about making a part in Texas, Oklahoma legislature says, you're not getting that corner of Oklahoma. Greer County. That's right. Yeah. So there's uh -huh. no way you're getting that. Uh -huh. And the Texans, they're smart. They're, they're very smart. They said, well, how about if we lease some land? Uh, who do we talk to? Well, that belongs to the Indians. And there was a period of time when, when the government didn't want the Indians making a deal with the Texans. They were suspicious. Right. But the Indians said, hey, this is our land. Didn't that kind of start with the Cherokee Strip, where it the did. Cherokee it people did. figured out they That's could right. lease that That's land right. and make a lot of money? And Quanta, Quanta Parker said, look, if the Cherokees can lease land to the pale face, mm -hmm. why can't I? Right. And, and by the way, uh, you know, you pale face keep telling me to cut our hair, and I've always had long hair. Why is it that my Chinaman, he had a Chinese servant, why, how come my Chinaman can wear his hair long and I can't? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and no one can answer that question. Right. Juan Parker was a very intelligent, he very, really, very, really very intelligent man. He really was. And But many of the Texans and many of the cowboys became the friends of Juan Parker. Mm -hmm. And as they managed to make a deal with the Comanches, they learned to make a, a, a deal with the next tribe. Well, the Kiowas are, are pretty fierce, too. Right. I mean, they're, they're, they're right there with the Comanches. And so you got to make a deal with the Comanches as you come through uh, the beginning of uh, uh, Indian territory. Now you got to let a few more steers go for the Kiowas. Mm -hmm. uh, who's next? The Arapahoes. Okay, let's let's give them a few. And then finally, there's the Cheyenne. Uh -huh. And so it was a question of, uh, of either cutting loose a few quality animals, uh, or uh, or else uh, being uh, in trouble with a, a knight. Uh, stampede or something like right, that. Right, right. And, you know, the, the cowboys, they've got 3,000 head of cattle. That's right. You, you, there's attrition. There is. You can, but just go into <laughs> expecting that That's to right. happen. That's right. You're going to get up there to Kansas. You'll have lost a few cattle. You know, I mean, it's just. But you can afford them. You can afford them rather than, than take a take it under the chin. Oh, right. You can take right. It. Absolutely. So that when you were talking about Quanta Parker and Burt Burnett and uh, Charles Goodnight, it made me think of the, the great story about uh, Theodore Roosevelt coming to Oklahoma for yes. the big wolf hunt. That's right. Jack Abernathy. That's right. That's right. Because Quanta Parker and Burt Burnett and Charles Goodnight and all of these big name oil men and ranchers from Texas, they were all there at that same hunt. Quanta Parker put the photograph, put the portrait of, of Teddy Roosevelt behind his chair, and in the star house, there was a, a bedroom for each of Quanta Parker's wives. Right. And uh, at one time, most of, I think, or a lot of his years had as many as five wives. And then uh, then some people say, well, he actually had about seven. Uh, he had uh, an incident. He went to Washington, D.C. on a number of trips. He enjoyed going to Washington, D.C. They treated him very well. Mm -hmm. And when he was in Washington, D.C., 
uh, all about uh, this was after the, the Star House was was built. One of the one of the government officials said, "Hey, Quana, uh, I understand that you've uh, decided to take up uh, the Jesus Road, the Pale Face, and even the Jesus Road." And uh, Quana Parker says, "That is true." And uh, so this official, he was very proud and sort of a pushy kind of a guy. Right. He says, yeah, uh, that's what I hear. But, you know, on the Jesus Road, uh, we only have one wife. And I've been told in such a way as to believe it that you got a whole bunch of wives. Now, uh, you got to give them up. Want to give them up, decide which one is going to be your wife. And I'll be back tomorrow to get your decision. And so uh, Quanah Parker says, we shall see about that. <laughs> So the next day, the official came to Quanah Parker, and Quanah Parker says, your time is up. Uh, I want to know your decision. Who, who's going to be your one and only, mm -hmm. your one wife? And Quanah Parker was very quiet and very dignified. Uh, he was uh, intelligent. He was dignified and a born leader. Right. He had blue-gray eyes. Uh, like his mother. His mother, uh -huh. Cynthia Ann. And, uh, and, and people were, were sometimes intimidated by Quantum Parker and, and, uh, or mesmerized. And so Quantum Parker finally spoke. He says, me no tell my woman, you no longer the wife of Quantum Parker. You tell. <laughs> and he wasn't about to do that. Right. So he kept, he kept his wives. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's a great story. So um, as far as the Native American connection. Are you familiar with, it's very difficult to research and find Native American cowboys. I know that they were on the trail. Historically, there's that information, but actually finding any of them by name is almost impossible. It's, it's a challenge. I watched a movie yesterday called Red River with John Wayne, uh -huh. 1947. And even in 1947, one of the cowboys is an Indian. Really? Yes. I, I, I encourage everyone to check that out. Uh, yes. And uh, in fact, the, the Indian is, uh, is making a deal with Cookie, the cook. Uh -huh. And uh, Cookie has uh, lost uh, a card game with uh, the Indian guy. And so the Indian guy now has his team and his full team. And so Cookie, every time he needs a meal, he has to make a deal, a new deal with the Indian guy that, that won the uh, the card game. So I knew I shouldn't have made a, a, a card game with an Indian. Right, right. So, uh, but yes, uh, there were those. And, uh, and, and of course, you know, the, the saga of Bill Pickett, uh, one of the right. most famous right. uh, Western uh, cowboys, uh, uh, African-American and, and others. He uh, was... He was part Native American, though, too, wasn't he? A lot of, a lot of the, uh, there was uh, because intermarriage. Because he was, like, free, a freedman? That's right, uh -huh. that's right. Does, and yeah. uh, and yeah. Bill Pickett was one that invented bull, uh, bull dog. Uh, yes. Where you can bring down the biggest bull if you got the uh, teeth to match. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I always tell I, tell, I teach about him. And I tell the kids he would bite them on the lip. And uh, they're like, what? <laughs> I said, I don't know. You don't have to do that in a rodeo. <laughs> But that was Bill Pickett's thing. Yeah, I don't know anyone who ever reenacts that. No. I, I don't know anybody. No. But yes, there were Native Americans that, that also took up the trail. And, uh, and that's a challenge. Uh, we have more information available in this age of information than ever before. Maybe uh, some young researcher uh, that has a mission can uh, bring some of that information. I, I would love for some, someone to be able to do that. And it would probably have to be maybe a family member that's right, kind that's of, right. you know, trace that down. And I wonder, what, what do you think um, about the fact that um, the, there was such a great push to civilize the Native Americans and for them to not use their language and to, you know, to do all the, all these things that the white man wanted them to do, that they didn't necessarily come to be a cowboy as a Native American because that that was it was just the the way of the day to push that down but you know there's there's, there's, there's two ways that what there's two ways that I would consider 
to uh, pursue uh -huh. that topic. Uh -huh. uh, one, of course, like you say, would be to, to find families. Uh -huh. And the oral history tradition has always been strong among Native American families. That's true. Right? And so uh, if I was uh, younger <laughs> and, and, and still have my marbles, uh, I would, uh, I would uh, talk to the elders of the tribes and say, uh, can you suggest to me, uh, please, uh, some of the families that, that would share information with me. Mm -hmm. And I promise I'll tell the truth. I'll promise I'll be supportive and I'll promise I will be positive about anything that we say. Right. And uh, let me talk to them about their family traditions. The second way that I would approach it and pursue that would be through the Oklahoma Historical Society. The Oklahoma Historical Society has an Indian archives mm -hmm. that has uh, topics that range even into the Chisholm Trail. Right. That might be a worthy way to pursue it and then along with the Indian archives and the Oklahoma Historical Society, uh, including their index, and the newspapers uh, would be a, a source mm -hmm. even, is mm -hmm. finally to, uh, to go to the oral histories. Uh, uh, Grant Foreman oral histories back in the 1940s and 50s, which wasn't too, that, too far removed uh, from the uh, from the uh, the descendants right. of the uh, the, uh, the Cat, like cattle drive that's right days. and uh -huh. the, the Chisholm Trail days right. so those are the ways that I would pursue that and you know whether it's uh, University of Oklahoma Oklahoma State University or any of the other colleges I think they would welcome a project of history of that nature mm -hmm. that would be a very I think like you say that'd be a great research project it would. for some. Uh, college student. I, would, I mean, that'd be almost a dissertation. It'd be break, it, it, it would be a, yeah. at least a thesis for a master's right. or a dissertation for a doctorate mm -hmm. level. That would be a major contribution to the history of the West. For sure. Yeah, Shaylee, you, you got that? <laughs> Shaylee is uh, a Native American student at Oklahoma State Outstanding. University. Outstanding. Yes, and uh, she's become very interested in Native American studies and things like that. Yes. So that's a topic. Yeah, she's minoring in that. So uh, yeah, hey, here, let me toss you a, <laughs> an idea there. Uh, but uh, I, Oklahoma Historical Society, I use them as a source for a lot of research. They do have yes so much they documentation do. there they do. but i i couldn't find anything in there at the at least as far as i was able to research online like you say maybe if you uh, went there and or and contacted them directly they may have some other oh, that's that's the only way to do it mm -hmm. uh, is to is to attract them to their their source and uh, and once you're there you'd be surprised how helpful uh, the librarians and how knowledgeable the librarians are. Mm -hmm. uh, I have done a number of research projects there and the Western History Collection at OU uh, is another source that, right. that I think about it that has not only incredible photographic uh, 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 remembrances of things that we're talking about mm -hmm. as well as uh, other information too. So, um, you know, there were there were tribal newspapers uh, there were uh, you know, the stories in the, in the regular newspapers that, that might be of some help. Ah, oh, that's very interesting. Of the, of the day. Right. And I wouldn't neglect Texas either uh, because uh, Texas mm -hmm. has got a, a rich uh, connection, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, they were coming out of Texas mm -hmm. uh, and even Kansas where they ended up on the, on the trail. Mm -hmm. There might be some uh, information there. That's true. That is really true. So um, what, what part of... Um, you know, kind of this, like this topic that you chose today. I, I really, I mean, you shared a lot of really great information, but um, when you, you know, is like this a lesson that you teach or is this something that you, um, you know, how do you, how do you prepare these kinds of things? Uh, well, uh, the, the, the easiest way for me to talk about uh, tribal history and traditions is to uh, zero in on specific aspects. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, most uh, of the Oklahoma tribes have, have got uh, very strong traditions about uh, who and what uh, the men did as part of their expectations of being a, a, a tribal brave, uh, being a tribal chief of, uh, of uh, you know, the women had a role, uh, the men had a role. And, uh, and, and if we want to explore what that role was in hunting, let's talk about hunting. 
if you want to talk about war, let's talk about the warrior societies mm -hmm. and how they got their war bonnets, mm -hmm. or if they even didn't use war bonnets. Mm -hmm. uh, Geronimo uh, had a medicine hat that was right. far more appropriate than a war bonnet. Sometimes you see photographs of Quanah Parker. He's wearing a full war bonnet like a Lakota chief. Other times he's got a couple of feathers. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the significance of a war bonnet? You don't just make your own war bonnet. In most cases that I'm familiar with, your warrior society uh, decided when you earned a feather, an eagle feather, your warrior society decided what kind of uh, a regalia uh, among the Kiowa. They had the, the Koetsinko, the 10 bravest. And being a member of that warrior society had huge responsibilities. If, if you look at Quanta Parker again with his big uh, headdress, say, wow, I wonder where he, where he found that. I wonder who gave that to him. Right. Well, uh, if you were in a, a battle with another tribe, uh, like the Sock and Fox, or taking on the Lakota, for example, uh, there were cases that were documented where one of our braves managed to slay his opponent and take his headdress. Uh -huh. uh, Kishkikosh was a, a Sock warrior. And, and he uh, took the life of a Lakota medicine man with the bull horn, oh, the, right. the, the buffalo bull horns headdress and wore it. And the significance of that is if you found on the battlefield or you dispatched an enemy, then you could take their possessions as your own. Mm -hmm. However, with every significant acquisition came responsibility. So if you see, if, if maybe you didn't, you were just in the in the fight and you found a, a full headdress on the ground and you guys won, you drove off the enemy, you took some horses. Uh, are you going to take the headdress as your own? You didn't earn it, but you were part of the fight that won it. You could, depending on your tribe and your warrior society, you could. But as soon as you did, came responsibility. As a chief, you were expected to feed anybody that came into your Lodge. Mm -hmm. As a war chief, you're expected to lead uh, a war party in the foreseeable future. As a chief, you're expected to give uh, extra hospitality to people or assistance to people that were in need. Mm -hmm. So there was a huge responsibility in, in becoming a chief. Uh, at the end of the Chisholm Trail, uh, Quanah Parker is a good example. He was the one who was given the, the respect. Uh, he was given the one who was given the opportunity to work with the cattlemen that had formerly been sending uh, these steers up the trail. Now they're they're not going up the trail anymore after 1884, 85, but they still need to graze their cattle. And the cattle uh, grazing places are so good in Indian Territory, in the Oklahoma Territory, so good. And so they lease land. And Quanah Parker gets like $1,000 a year, and, and some years are better than others. And by uh, the beginning of the 1890s, Quanah Parker is a very wealthy man. He can, he can feed all of his wives and all of their children. He has about 24 children. Okay. And, uh, and seven, the better part of seven wives. Uh, two of them finally left and went somewhere else. Okay. So uh, he loves to entertain. Uh, one of the stories about Quanah Parker is that when uh, important uh, generals came, uh, they would say, don't, don't you know who I am? And Quanah would say, I have more stars than you do, you know? Uh, yeah. And because Quanah went to Washington, where, where President Roosevelt entertained him, mm -hmm. he noticed Quanah is very, very observant. And he noticed that when they brought the wine, they were in, in pretty little wine glasses. So when his dignitaries came from Washington, whether they're the army or whether they were government officials or whoever they were, he told all of his helpers in the kitchen, put out the big glasses. <laughs> he was more generous than the pale face. Right. And he wanted everybody to know it. Right. So I love it that you were describing the role of the chief because um, not long ago, uh, I was I did a lesson about chiefs of the Plains tribes. Yes. And how... By calling someone chief, 
the government assumed that person was in such a leadership role that they could speak for an entire tribe of people. And but there were multiple chiefs, that's right, and they might have different responsibilities. They had to have a consensus on. most yes. of the time. They had to have a consensus. Yes, and so there was a lot of that caused a lot of the confusion and a lot of the treaty signing that what it wasn't representative of everyone in that's the right. tribe right. and or even the right people in the tribe. Right, right. exactly. And that's just what you know how that how that really played out. It was one of the it's, tragedies of the West. And that, but that's that's just another one of those um ideas that unless you unless you take the time to read and kind of research that down, you just assume that this one person either didn't wasn't as powerful as they uh claimed to be because they said they were the chief. No. You know, you don't you don't put it into perspective that the government was misinterpreting that title mm -hmm. and, and, that authority. and they were assigning more power to that person than they had. In, in most instances, it was more like uh, honored advice mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and sage wisdom. And, and like I say, uh, a, a consensus was, was, was required. Uh, before any major decision was made, and a lot of a lot of uh, the the councils were lengthy and and might not even arrive at a consensus mm -hmm. for a number of uh, days or or whatever. Was the the uh, medicine lodge mm -hmm. was that the one that Jesse Chisholm was? He was very much a part of the treat. Was it that what it was called? The Treaty of Medicine Lodge, eighteen sixty seven in Kansas. Okay. That's right. Okay. And and there were there were uh, chiefs that that uh, had signed that, and there was others that did not. Mm -hmm. And uh, and some of those that signed it later because of the failure to provide the provisions, the failure to keep yes. the promises. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the chiefs say, "Hey, uh, all bets are off." Yeah. Uh, the pale face has has shown us his disrespect. The pale face has shown us his uh, unwillingness to meet his promises. They expect us to keep our promises and not to go into this part to hunt and not to go into that part for trading and not to go down into these places that have always been ours and we're supposed to stay out of there and they will not keep their word. Right. The pale face speaks with 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 fork tongue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so Jesse Chisholm's role was that of being an interpreter. He spoke 16 Native American and a facilitator and a facilitator. And a facilitator. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so uh, he really, he was the one that, that really enabled a lot of the, uh, the Chisholm Trail to, to not only happen, but to happen in a peaceful manner. Mm -hmm. Because if it hadn't been for his ability and his understanding of both, both the white man's world and the red man's world, right. uh, there could have been some serious problems. Right. Because the Chisholm Trail started in 1867. That's right. That's so right. would it, that, would that was, have been uh, just about the same time as this uh, Medicine Lodge well, situation? Yes. That's right. That's right. That's right. It's, it's really within the same year yes. that, that you had these things going on. And, and there are still buffalo in 1867. There's still buffalo in 1870. There's still buffalo in 1873, but they're beginning to be slaughtered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And by and by the end of the Tristan Trail period, the buffalo are gone, gone, gone. Right, right. Yeah, it's a it's a uh messy, it's a messy history, the way you know that all plays out there. It's not a there's there's heroes and villains on both sides. Right. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. But the, I mean, the, the, you know, wrap up of the topic for today is that the Native Americans did have a connection with the success of the Chisholm Trail, namely Jesse Chisholm himself. But um, just, I guess, um, here's what I'm taking. My takeaway um, was. The um, the business side mm -hmm. of how to uh, communicate with the cowboys mm -hmm. and to be able to provide for their families mm -hmm. in a way that made made both sides uh, 
I don't know, happy is not a very good word, but one of the, one of the things I would say is that uh, again, this incident I talked about where the uh, where the Braves came in yes. and rescued the cowboys that were drowning, yes. and the horses that were I love that, that story. Uh, at the end of that incident, the trail boss sat down with the Comanche chief. We don't know his name. That would be another great research project. Yes. But they started talking together. They started talking together because they were speaking in Spanish. Uh -huh. And so the, many of the Comanches knew Spanish mm -hmm. and the Kiowas too. Mm -hmm. And so this particular cowboy, this trail boss, he knew Spanish very well. And rather than just uh, do the, the sign language, and you know, this is the sign of the cowboys. It's cowboy brim is out like this. Right. And uh, this is a sign of riding his horse, right? This. Uh -huh. And how many days journey? Well, you make the sign of the sun. You go like this and you say how many days. And, and, and the other sign languages, but it's limited. Right. When you've got a common language, they talk, they, these two guys started talking about the old days and about the days when there was wars between the pale face and the Indian, and the days when there was wars, uh, terrific fights among the Mexicans right. and, and the Indians, right. and, and, and that extended to Geronimo. And so the, the, the fascinating thing about American history, looking at it from a positive viewpoint for a moment, is that is those who had been enemies became friends on the trail. Mm -hmm. They became allies and ultimately in the form particularly of Quantum Parker, business partners. Right, right. I love that. And they benefited, right. they benefited both sides. Uh -huh. So it was possible for both the Indian community to be benefited. It was possible for the pale face community to be benefited without anybody getting hurt. Mm -hmm. And I mean, what a great example of diversity on the trail That's right. that you have the cowboy, the Native American speaking to each other right. in Spanish. That's right. I I mean, that's that is perfect. That really is. That is great. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Being a guest it's here been today. A pleasure. I this has just been so interesting. So much great information. I can't wait to have you back, and I will. I absolutely will. I look forward to that. So, um, guys, next week, um, Abigail Billings is going to be here. She is a local uh, teenager. She has been a guest before. And um, she is uh, just a, a busy young woman. And she is involved in uh, becoming a United States agriculture queen. And so she has some uh, really good uh, things she's going to come and uh, share with us. So be sure and tune in next Thursday, uh, July the 13th, I believe is the day of that day. But Mr. McGee, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Uh, whenever we sign off, we say happy trails. Happy so, trails to yeah, you. Yeah, so you ready? Yes. Happy trails. Happy trails. <laughs>